Well, is this on? Hello? Is that on? Okay. Is this on now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is on? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let, me, uh, let me thank uh, you all for coming and let me uh, thank all of the people who have been such fine hosts and to Charbel in particular for uh, being kind enough to in invite me to come here. Um, I'm excited to be here for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons I, um, I'm excited, uh, of the people here, I, I am the most, um, my work is, has been the least, has had the least to do with ecology. Okay, I have not really been that involved in, in ecology until relatively recently, in the last couple of years I've, I've started to think about it. I am, by uh, training, a general philosopher of science, and I do metaphysics and causality and things like this. Um, and so it's really exciting to come talk to you, and I, I, I feel a little bit uh, uh, a little bit sheepish about this. Uh, you know, to me, for, for a philosopher of science to come talk to some scientists, and especially to offer some sort of normative suggestions, this would be somewhat like a linguist if I were a linguist, an English-speaking linguist, and I came to tell you how you might speak Portuguese better, um, <laughs> and I can tell you I would not be very helpful, right? Uh, and, and I think, you know, and this is one of the interesting things for philosophers of science, because in uh, one of the great developments in philosophy of science, I think, over the last 50 years is a movement to what's sometimes called a naturalistic philosophy of science, which basically means a philosophy of science that pays attention to what scientists actually do. Um, so I, I, I'm grateful and, uh, th to have this opportunity to talk to you and, and I hope that actually I may be able to say something just as, you know, a linguist can sometimes tell you something interesting about your own language and I, I hope that maybe I can say some things that are interesting here. So, um, but I thought I would take refuge by starting with a famous ecologist who can tell us something important here. This is from... Simon Levin in a MacArthur Award lecture in 1989. He says that understanding patterns in terms of processes that produce them is the essence of science and is the key to the development of principles for management. <coughs> Without an understanding of mechanisms, one must evaluate each new stress on each new system de novo. With such understanding, one has a foundation for understanding and management. And I, I was so glad to find that, uh, that Levin had said this because this is really the theme of my talk. The theme of my talk is about the relationship between pattern and mechanism. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the key to this, uh, to this uh, approach to thinking about science that I'm calling the new mechanical philosophy. Uh, and, and it's really, I think, something which a number of ecologists, there's actually a number of people who said things like this in, uh, uh, in ecology, and I think that this, um, uh, this captures this idea. And I want to emphasize here what he says, it, this is the foundation for understanding and management. And the idea here about management, management is really about control. It means that if you do not understand mechanisms, you cannot control things. So we can, we can have patterns, we can find patterns, but mechanisms are the things which give us the opportunity for control, which is so important in uh, applied ecology. So this is what I'm going to do today. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the context of this, um, this philosophical movement, the new mechanical philosophy, and then introduce you to just a few key concepts and, and, and claims uh, about this. Um, and so this is going to be a general philosophy of science issues. Then I'm going to um, conclude by looking much more specifically at mechanistic modeling. And I should say I'll start with a general discussion of what philosophers of science have had to say about what modeling is lately. So I'm going to try to address some of the issues of the theory of modeling that, or philosophy of modeling that Greg was talking about. Uh, and then I want to focus on the idea of what a mechanistic model is and talk about the relationship of those in particular to uh, individual based models. So that's where we're going to go. Um, okay, so first, the, the, the context of this, uh, 
uh, new mechanical philosophy. I should tell you, the term new mechanical philosophy is not a term that I invented. It's, it's in, out in the literature. Uh, that some people use it to refer to this stuff. But it's, it is probably going to be the title of the book I'm writing. And so what you're uh, hearing is, uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about what this thing is in general, and I want to, if I can distill it into a couple of key claims, they are these. First thing, this is a view not just about science, it's about nature. And it says that of nature that all or almost all phenomena are the product of mechanisms. If you want to know why only almost all, that's for questions. Um, but all the ecological phenomena are so. Um, and then it says of science that scientists represent and understand natural phenomena by means of creating models of these mechanisms. So, so there's, a, there's a claim about the way the world is, and there's a claim about the way that science operates to understand uh, and, and, op and control that world. So who are these people? Um, I think you can use this term in a narrow sense and in a broad sense. In, in a narrow sense, what happened um, in the last you know, 15 or so years, this has become a very hot topic in philosophy of science. These are sort of the, the three first papers or, or books. Uh, Bechtel and Richardson uh, wrote a book called Discovering Complexity, which very few people read at first. Um, I wrote a paper called Mechanisms of the Nature of Causation, which I had a hard time getting published. Um, and, uh, and not too many people read it first. Then a paper came out in 2000 by Mockhamer, Darden, and Craver, which among other things criticized Bechtel and I for a couple of things. Um, that paper is the most widely cited uh, paper in philosophy of science in the last decade by quite a lot. It's actually, um, and, and this has now created this very large literature talking about this idea of mechanism. Um, and, and uh, you know, th these, you know, citations in the, in, and, and papers in the hundreds and, and more lately. So this is a, and when people talk about these, these people, they, the new mechanical philosophers are actually a term that people sometimes use as the mechanistas. Um, they're referring to this body of work. But I actually think that this is part of a much broader trend in philosophy of science in the last, really, last 50 or even 60 <coughs> years. And really what this is, is it is a, um, you know, Greg talked about this old philosophy of science and Pedro asked about Popper and, 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 and Hempel. Uh, this, this period of philosophy of science from about uh, the 1920s into the 1960s uh, was dominated by this philosophical movement called logical empiricism of which those people are connected. Um, and since that time there have been a set of developments in philosophy which I think have been moving us towards this mechanistic approach. And let me just mention a few of them. First of all, just the notion that the world is complex and disordered and cannot be characterized in terms of simple patterns or regularities. There's some names up here for those people who care of some prominent philosophers who are associated with this idea. Um, second is the idea that special sciences have unique problems and methods, that there's no one scientific method. So this is where it's only in this period that we start having the idea that there is such a thing as philosophy of biology or philosophy of uh, ecology or philosophy of neuroscience or whatever. Um, and then an increased interest in understanding the causes of things. It turns out that in the, in the history of logical empiricism, uh, a couple of things you will, words that you will never see in that philosophical literature is the word mechanism or the word cause. They're not there. Generalization, law, phenomena, things like this. But these, the idea that we could talk about causes, that was something that empiricists thought we could not do. Um, and so, and you know, uh, Greg mentioned uh, Wesley Salmon, famous person who sort of started in the one world and came to recognize that you really needed to talk about causes. Um, so, and, and, and 
Finally here, that models are idealized, heuristic, and often clearly false, but are key tools for representing and intervening in nature. So these are just some ideas uh, that have been you know, around for quite some time that I think are connected to this. Okay, now I'm going to go to a really strange source. For, if you aren't a philosopher, you, you might not recognize how strange this is to bring, be bringing up Wittgenstein uh, in this. But Wittgenstein uh, is arguably the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. Um, and this is a, a couple of quotations <coughs> from a, a book that, uh, or from some lectures he gave in the 1930s uh, called The Blue Book. And this is what Wittgenstein says, and he's talking about philosophy. He says, now what makes it difficult for us is our craving for generality. And, and the main source of that craving is our preoccupation with the method of science, the method of reducing explanation of natural phenomena to the smallest possible number of primitive natural laws, and in mathematics of unifying the treatment of different topics by the use of generalization. He says that philosophers are tempted to ask and answer questions in the way that science does, and this tendency leads us into darkness. And what he calls the craving for generality, he says, could also have been called the contemptuous attitude towards the particular case. Now, I think this is a very interesting set of remarks from Wittgenstein. Uh, and Wittgenstein was directing them towards philosophers who were, who were trying to create these very general theories. But he was saying the reason that philosophers shouldn't do that is they can't do what science does. But what's interesting is I think what we have discovered is that science couldn't do what Wittgenstein thought science does. So in other words, what I want to suggest to you is that the craving for generality, which is a great term, is really not just a philosophical illness. It's a scientific illness. Um, and and the contemptuous attitude towards the particular case. I mean, I think that, um, so, but this leads us to the big dilemma. When I say it's an illness, the craving for generality is not stupid. It, it's very natural. Here's my big dilemma. This is kind of like um, uh, Greg's uh, cognitive, what was it? Predicament. Cognitive predicament, except I'm going to say this in a, a much broader way for ecology, science, and life in general. It is that reality is particular. But our needs and interests are general. Now what do I mean by this? I mean that each individual, be it uh, you know, an individual person, an individual ant, an individual landscape, uh, actually, believe it or not, an individual molecule in many cases, has distinctive properties. And that that is where reality is. But the, prob uh, but the problem is that in order to live in the world, we need to be able to generalize so that we can understand, you know, I need to know how to talk to you even though each of you are different. But I need general rules so that I can interact. And the same thing for science. We know that each particular um, habitat that we might be looking at is distinctive in particular, and yet we need general rules so that we can uh, protect that habitat or in intervene in that habitat. And so that is the big dilemma, and I think that it is an enormous dilemma for ecology. Um, so anyway, so that's the context of this. Uh, so let's now turn to key concepts and claims of the new mechanical philosophy. So, the first thing that these new mechanists uh, started arguing about was how you, what's a mechanism? And one of the things that you should be thinking about, and you know, it's kind of funny because to ask what's a mechanism is to ask what's a mechanism in general, right? I'm showing a craving for generality and I, I, I feel this is ironic. But at any rate, and, and, and it is entirely appropriate, you know, even though I told you that philosophers never use this word until starting really in the 70s and 80s, um, you know it's all over science. I mean, I go, I, I look at the latest edition of Nature and there's like 1,600 uses of the word in one issue, right? You know, but it is an entirely reasonable uh, 
question to ask whether those uses of those words correspond to any definite single concept. <coughs> because it may be that it just doesn't, that there is no such thing as what a mechanism is. But I'm going to boldly tell you that there is. Here it is. Um, now, a mechanism for a phenomena consists of entities whose activities and interactions are organized in such a way that they are responsible for this phenomena. Now, I, I could spend a lot of time talking about why all those words are what they are, and I, I won't here. I'll tell you, this comes from a, a recent paper by two British philosophers who came up with something that looked almost like this after reading all of the articles about this and saying this is what everyone really should just say. And I think they're almost right, but I had to change it just a little bit more. So this is the one that's gonna be in my book. Let me talk about what those pieces are, the, the kind of key ideas. The first key idea in talking about mechanisms is what I, I like to call functional individuation. You don't say a mechanism, you say a mechanism for some phenomena or a mechanism for some behavior, unless you talk about what the thing, what the phenomena is that the mechanism produces, there's no definite sense of what the mechanism is. Um, so, you know, we understand um, a car is a mechanism for getting around town, right? You know, and if we talk about the car in terms of that, we're going to talk about the, we're going to divide it up into its pieces and explain its workings with reference to the properties that make it move. But cars also do things, like cars also melt the chocolate that I inadvertently leave in, on the seat in the hot day. For that purpose, and in that context, the parts that are involved and the properties of those parts that are involved are entirely different. So there's no such thing as, you know, you're not a mechanism, but you have lots of mechanisms for doing lots of things that are, uh, that are part of explaining the phenomena that you produce. So mechanisms consist of, I'm going to just put these together, entities, activities, and interactions. So the idea is that mechanisms are, are consist of collections of, of things, right? So if we think about a synapse, we might talk about the various components of the synapse, the various uh, kinds of compounds. We might talk about the gates, and we might talk about um, you know, you know the, the, the axons and whatever the various pieces are that we're going to talk about in the synapse, right? Um, and in the car, we'd be talking about the carburetor and the drivetrain and, and so on. Um, but the thing is that these, what makes a mechanism do what it does is that these entities do things, which we're calling activities and interactions, right? So, um, and some things are activities that you do kind of on your own. Those are the activities, like if I walk, and some involve interactions, like if we dance, right? Those are the, so, so, but these are, these are all, in some sense, activities. And then the other part about this is organization. So, so the idea is that a pile of entities is not a mechanism until it's organized in some way. And, and crucial to mechanistic explanation is understanding organization. Uh, it's... And so, you know, if I take, you know, a car and I take all the parts and I stick it there, I don't have a car. I have a pile of car parts, right? So it's that organization. That organization, uh, typically uh, spatial and temporal organization, but ultimately what it's about is causal organization. It's about what are the causal relations between these parts that are productive of the phenomena. And then the last thing I want to emphasize here is particularity. And this is the idea that one, that, that, that a mechanism, just like any other individual, I mean, here's an object here, right? This is a clicker I've got. And this is one particular clicker here. Somebody else might have a, a very similar clicker in their bag or not. And, and, you know, there's some factory that mass produces these. But each one is different. The source of its causal powers are right here. <coughs> locally and they have to do with the particular parts. You know, this is actually not unrelated to an idea that, that I, many biologists talk about. You know, when you talk about population thinking and you talk about variability and, and, and all of this, the idea that you, that to understand what's actually going on in populations, you can't, pay, you can't talk about the ideal type. 
you have to talk about the actual organisms, and in particular in the context of evolution, of the variation, right? So that's an example of focusing on particularity. So, so mechanisms are in particular places and times. So, um, a couple of points that I want to emphasize sort of generally about properties of mechanisms. Um, first of all, mechanisms are hierarchical. So the parts of mechanisms are themselves composed of parts and the activities of mechanisms are composed of finer grained activities. And you can see, I, I, I hope you're kind of seeing that this really works really well with ecological systems, right? So that we can talk about, uh, you know, a, a mechanism which produces some population level phenomena uh, and we have to understand that there the parts involved might be individual organisms, right? Uh, and those organisms themselves are made up of, uh, you know, various, say, say, tissues and other sort of, you know, functional units of organization which are made up of further ones and so on. So this is part of the mechanistic view. Um, and then this is a view about emergence, right? That what happens typically with mechanisms is that these mechanisms are systems which consist of parts and the behavior of the whole is produce is an emergent phenomenon that comes from the, the part and, and, and you know I think what Steve was talking about this is exactly this is the ontological explanation of why the kind of modeling strategy that that Steve was talking about makes some sense in studying emergent phenomena so um, I do want to emphasize because this is often misunderstood that the mechanistic viewpoint is not exclusively reductive because some people will say the problem with this is that you just explain the high level thing in terms of the next level, in terms of the next level, and really all you care about is physics. No. And the reason is because when you study mechanisms, you recognize that there are both compositional and contextual elements to understanding the interactions between parts. So in other words, and sometimes, interestingly, a lot of what's going on inside doesn't matter. The, con the contextual variables are what matters. So, um, this doesn't, this is a somewhat reductive point of view, but not completely. Um, and the last thing I want to emphasize here, coming back to the theme of generality, is, you know, if these mechanisms are singular in particular, why is it, and how could we possibly ever have generalizations, okay? Um, so, the first thing is that many mechanisms persist and behave approximately similarly over time. So if I have like my car, my car is a particular thing. And, but there's generalizations about the behavior of my car which are pretty stable over time. You know, when I start it today and I start it tomorrow, it works basically the same. And the reason, of course, is because of the persistence of the organization and the entities and the activities over time. Um, secondly, many individual mechanisms behave similarly to others of their kind, either by design, natural selection, or happenstance. So, you know, there's lots of instances of my car, right, that are very similar by design. Natural selection is a process which will create some degree of uniformity under sufficient selective pressures, right? And that explains why there is a great deal of similarity between the uh, uh, between this, our, our structures as organisms and so on, right? So you can, even though each thing is different, you can often make generalizations which are at least approximately true. Um, but one of the things I want to mention here, this is a view about generalization that I think is, is key to the whole idea of the uh, mechanistic approach. Generalizations that describe the behavior of mechanisms, or you could just say the patterns, they're what I call mechanistically explicable generalizations. That is, what makes the generalization true is that there is a mechanism which produces it. And this is an inversion of a sort of classic view of the relationship between the general and the particular in thinking about nature. Because the, a classic view says that what makes things true is laws of nature. And the particulars are true because they, they conform to the laws of nature. But here what this is saying is no. The laws of nature, if there are any such things, and they're really not, Jiminy, such things, 
they, most of them, at least, arise simply as descriptions, generalizations about the behavior of these particulars. Okay, so that's, um, that's a, a, a few general points about this, this view. Uh, let me make a couple of points about the virtues for ecology. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this new mechanical philosophy, this literature uh, originated and, and became influential originally in philosophy of biology, but mostly dealing with molecular biology, uh, uh, neuroscience. Uh, it's expanded. There's now a lot of talk about this in the social sciences, but it hasn't made it into ecology. I only know of, of you know, four or five papers which talk about this at all explicitly in, that are related to ecology. Um, but nonetheless, ecology is all about interactions between organisms, their environment, and how they produce phenomena and populations, landscapes, ecosystems, which is to say they're all about mechanisms. This, this is a, this ontological framework uh, fits very nicely with the apparent ontology of ecological systems. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, Greg commented on, ecology has historically been very hard pressed to find its laws, right? And the good thing about this philosophical view is it explains why, because there aren't any, okay? And, and it says, and by the way, you're not alone in this predicament, right? That this is actually true of many other things. Well, it's very interesting. There's people who believe this about physics now, too, which I can talk a little bit about later. Okay. So, how am I doing for time? Uh, no, you have... Uh, I'm, no, I have 20, of time. What, 20 uh, you have minutes? more 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Excellent. Um, okay. So, so that's general background on this view. Now I want to actually start talking more about ecology and, and, and modeling here. So... I put a question mark here. I don't actually think that mechanistic modeling is a safety for ecology. I think it's a very important component of strategy. Um, so, keeping in mind things that both Steve and Greg said about how you have to pay attention to your cognitive goals uh, in thinking about uh, what you're doing in modeling. I thought I might just start with a very general observation which should, I hope, seem incredibly obvious about why we care about ecology. Um, here are some examples of the kinds of questions that we might uh, uh, be interested in. Uh, you know, how does pollution affect diversity and abundance of fauna in estuaries? Does landscape fragmentation increase risk of desertification? What are the effects of pollinator diversity on the agricultural, on agricultural, resilience and productivity. Uh, you see, I just happen to think of these. Um, <laughs> but th these, are, th these are, are obviously from your project, are examples of the kinds of questions that one might talk about uh, and are very, I think, typical. Uh, oh, I have another one. Oh, yes, what kinds of rehabilitation regimes increase the rate of success for reintroduction of captured animals into the wild? Okay, so what characterizes all of these questions? Well, <clears throat> here's my big picture answer. I crave generality. Um, but <laughs> ecology offers the opportunity to measure, understand, and manage the impact of human-induced changes to populations, communities, and ecosystems. I, I think, you know, this is why, um, to the extent that we manage to get funding for these enterprises, I think that this is in the background, right? So we're interested, uh, and I want to emphasize especially the management aspect here, right? Understanding and management. Uh, now, <coughs> how do we achieve those goals? Um, seems to me like there you can categorize the tools that we have for doing this in, in three ways. And these actually correspond fairly nicely to your axes uh, in, your, in your studies. So, uh, but not exactly. So one is observation and, and measurement, field uh, ecology. One is experiment, right? And, and you understand um, this is, is for me a very crucial difference to pay attention to that, that you know, experiment involves manipulation of variables and experiment involves control of variables. Observation uh, does not. And I guess, and the third is modeling. And 
I think the thing about these tools is each of these tools has evident benefits and evident flaws. So the problem with ob observation and measurement, this is when we talk about pattern. And Simon Levin talked about pattern. That's what he's talking about, right? We go and we find these patterns by observation and measurement. But the thing about pattern is that if you simply look at pattern without looking at the causes of the pattern, you don't know whether the pattern will persist and whether the pattern that you find in one locale is going to uh, be seen in another locale, right? So, so, so pure observational knowledge is much less likely to be transportable and hence general and hence usable, right? So experiment. The good thing about experiment, experiment is traditionally understood as the way that one acquires causal knowledge. Right? This goes back a long time um, uh, in the history of the philosophy of science, to, uh, especially to John Stuart Mill and Mill's so-called Mill's methods for discovering causes. And, and so this is the idea. And, and Greg talked about this other idea, which is a, a, a more modern um, version of this that's been very important. This is so-called manipulability theories of causation, which basically says that for something to be a cause of something else means that if you wiggle it, something else wiggles. You can think of it as the wiggling view of causation. And that's what experimenters do, right? Now, this is good because it gives you causal knowledge. Causal knowledge gives you control. But what's the problem with this? This gives you causal knowledge of highly localized, highly artificial systems. So you may become very able to control those systems, but, um, but the application to other systems is not always evident. And another problem I should emphasize about experimental knowledge is experiment in ecology is really hard, right? Because the time scales and the size scales, you know, if you want to do experiment on Drosophilia, that's pretty easy because there's lots of them. You know, you can kill them, it doesn't matter. Um, you, you can't do that, right? So, so, um, so this is a very important limitation for ecology. So that's why we turn to modeling. Um, you know, the advantage of modeling is that it's cheap um, in some sense. Uh, and in particular, this is something I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about as we go on. It, um, <clears throat> It's an opportunity for doing uh, artificial experiments, experiments in the model. But the question about modeling is, while modeling is cheap, the relationship of the model to any reality is potentially quite tenuous, right? And so that's the downfall of these three things. So the question is, how do we put these things together to give us some general knowledge of these particular systems? That's, that's our question. So I want to talk um, here for a few minutes about some work on um, recent work by some philosophers about what modeling is and how to think about it conceptually. Um, the, the title, The Strategy of Model-Based Science, comes from a 2005-ish paper by Peter God... Did I have, no, I don't have that. Um, by Peter Godfrey-Smith. Um, but I think this... this basic picture has been popularized by a philosopher named Ron Geary, started in like the 1980s. Um, and the point here is that you have three things here. You have a model description. Think of this as like sets of equations or, or it could be diagrams, it could be any of a number of things, which specifies a model system. A model system is typically understood to be an abstract mathematical entity or something like that. You can also talk about physical models, which is another uh, business and has some similarities here. But then what you <coughs> specified is the model system, and then you argue that the model system resembles in, in some degrees and respects a target system. So, <coughs> and the crucial point about this strategy is it suggests that the relationship between your descriptions, your theory over here, and your, and your world is indirect. It's mediated via this model. And uh, that's as, as opposed to a more direct attempt to represent phenomena. I think actually, uh, uh, to kind of give a partial answer to Pedro's question to Greg, uh, 
I think this is actually one of the reasons why some of this falsification of stuff doesn't work. That whole paradigm was caught up with an idea that there were theories which were descriptions of, of observable variables which were true. And if they weren't true, they were false and we should reject them. But here we have a much fuzzier notion, which is the notion of resemblance, which is one of the fuzziest notions you can possibly get. And one of the things about resemblance is that we can resemble, two things can resemble each other in an arbitrary number of ways and not resemble them in another. You know this from like talking about your kids and your parents, right? Um, and Geary has a nice metaphor for talking about models. He said models are like maps. And you know, the thing about maps is there are different kinds of maps. You know, there's topographic maps, there's traffic maps, there's, um, you, you know, there's, there's maps that, that uh, you know, infrared maps, there's, you know, there's all kinds of maps, right? And, and what those maps do is they identify some set of properties with respect to which they want to resemble the target system and they ignore the others. So, so that's the way to think about models. Now, Greg briefly alluded to this very famous paper by um, Richard Levins from 1966 called The Strategy of Model Building and Population Biology. Um, and it was Levins who I think first articulated this very important fact about modeling, which is that modeling always involves trade-offs, right? And, and uh, he had a view here that said that there were sort of three dimensions. And I think actually, you know, Greg has a slightly different view, which was his little diagram, right? But I think it's it, interesting to talk, and in fact in his book he does talk about the relationship between this and that, but we won't worry too much. But the basic point here, realism I think is, is fidelity to causal structure. Predict, precision I take to roughly be the precision with which a pattern is reproduced. And generality, the number of places you can apply the model. And uh, Levin said you, you can't have it all, right? And, and he's right. Um, now, there's been some, um, there's a philosopher of, uh, of science who works particularly in, in philosophy of biology and is actually one of the philosophers who's really working in ecology, uh, Michael Weisberg from the University of Pennsylvania, who wrote a, 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 a very widely discussed paper um, that came out in the Journal of Philosophy in 2007 called Three Kinds of Idealization. Uh, and in this, uh, he has something which I take to be a kind of follow-on and further articulation of talking about the different strategies of model building. And what, the way that, um, the way that Weisberg talks about this, he goes and looks at some examples of models to try to show how this works, is that, again, you must pay attention to the goal if you are going to know what kind of models to build. And he identifies a set of what he calls representational ideals. These are things that a modeler might care about in designing the model. Um, and, and so just to run through them quickly, one is this idea of completeness. Think about, I, 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 you know, Steve Salmon model looked like it was maybe making this mistake, right? Um, but there are times in which completeness may be a virtue. There, there, and there are systems which may be simple enough for which completeness is appropriate. Um, another is simplicity. And this is the idea that you create the simplest possible model that qualitatively explains some target phenomenon. Um, you know, a great example of this is Copernicus's model of the solar system, right? Uh, the basic point was there's a sun in the center, <coughs> planets go around in circles, right? They don't go around in circles, we know that they don't, and there was actually a whole bunch of complicated uh, math to try to make things look more precise. But in terms of understanding the basic phenomena of the retrograde motion of the planets, this very simple model got it, right? So that's an example of a simple model. Now this is, uh, this is a kind of ideal, um, and it's a little difficult to un untangle these two ideals, uh, but Michael calls it one causal ideal, which is basically the idea that you want to capture the primary 
difference-making causes for target phenomena. So, so the idea is these are, the, these are the variables that account for the largest part of the, of the properties of the phenomena. The ones that if you changed or altered would produce significant effects. So, you know, think about gravity and friction, right? The friction always takes, uh, plays a role in explaining the behavior of falling objects, right? But typically, that's a negligible enough effect that the primary cause is gravity, and so you ignore it to get the, 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 the causal structure. Um, then we have generality. A and P stand for actual and potential, or po actual and possible. So this is, this is very much the same thing Levin's talked about. And finally, this idea of creating a maximally accurate um, uh, description of the target phenomena. And this is the pattern, right? This is really, I think, Levin's is precision. So as we think about models, and, and the reason I'm bringing this to you is I want to talk about when I get to mechanistic and individual-based models, I want to ask, what are, what are the representative ideals that are involved in those kinds of models? Um, now, now I'm going to not talk about this nice equation, um, right? But you, pr presumably many of you recognize uh, this is an example of a, of a sort of simple analytic model, famous uh, competition model, right? Um, and I'm, I'm putting this up by way of contrast to mechanistic models. This is not a mechanistic model. Um, and it's not a mechanistic model in ecology, I believe, because the mechanism that it is involved in producing uh, uh, this interspecific competition is interactions between individual organisms or uh, interactions between individual organisms and resources that might be located in the environment. Th that there's, there's a story at the, at the individual level, whereas this is a population uh, and community level model, right? So, um, I, I don't think I need to tell you anything about this model, except to say that um, I don't think it captures the causes. And there's some question about whether it captures the patterns. It may be I think you might argue that it does, it is a very simple model, right? And it may capture some basic elements of the phenomenon. But there's a lot of criticism of these kinds of models, right? There has been a lot of criticism of these kinds of models in ecology. And now I'm going to take refuge in another famous ecologist, uh, David Tillman, uh, and, and a paper that he wrote back in the late 80s on the importance of mechanisms of interspecific competition. Um, so, this, this was a criticism of experimental work that was designed based upon the, the sort of structural assumptions of the, the lack of Volterra models, right? And this is, this is just to summarize this whole paper in like a few words. The first thing is that experiments designed to test for the existence of interspecific competition are inadequate because they ignore the distinction between direct competition and indirect competition. Secondly, competition is defined phenomenologically, pattern-wise, in terms of changes of species density. No actual account of what's doing it, right? Third, experimental designs which focus on single species manipulations ignore multi-species effects. And fourth, Research into the mechanisms of direct competition will create better understanding of the causes of patterns in ecosystems. So this all sounds good to me. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, what does Tillman mean by mechanism? Um, and it, he at least tells you what mechanistic studies of competition are here. So let's read what he says here. That a study of competition is mechanistic if it includes both the direct process by which the competition occurs, and information on the physiology, morphology, and or behavior of individual species or functional groups relevant to that direct process. Um, and he goes on to say that a mechanistic approach to competition is potentially powerful because of the wide variety of patterns that it can predict. Knowledge of mechanisms made of competition can be used to make many separate testable predictions about natural phenomena and experimental responses in natural or artificial communities. And so, so this, um, 
I, I, I think that he's saying very much exactly the same thing that Simon Levin said in the first book, that, that the call here is that this is what's going to distinguish, you know, get us at the causes of patterns, which is going to allow us to make predictions, and so on. So that's what Tillman says what a mechanistic model is. Uh, let me tell you what I think a mechanistic model is, which I think is pretty similar. Um, so just remind you what I said a mechanism is, and I highlight in red here the key sort of components that there's four phenomena, there are entities, activities, and interactions that are organized to produce that. So what's a model of a mechanism? Well, I think of it as being a two-part thing. I think of it as being a description of the phenomenon. So it's a description of the pattern, and then it is a description of the way in which the entities and activities that make up this mechanism are organized so as to produce this. Okay? So it's so the crucial point is that there's always two levels. There's always the phenomenal level, and there's the um, uh, and, and, and there's the description of the organization of the entities and activities. So um, in thinking about uh, individual-based models, it occurred to me that there are two very interestingly different kinds of mechanisms at work in talking about this. And I don't like these terms, and if anyone has good suggestions, please tell me. But one kind is what I call individual mechanisms, which produce phenomena by the coordination and activities of reasonably small, a reasonably <coughs> small number, that should be, a specialized and different small differentiated, specialized and differentiated set of parts, okay? So, um, as opposed to what I call an ensemble mechanism, which produces phenomena by local interactions of a large ensemble of parts of the same kind. Now, uh, easiest way is to look at a picture. Here are two mechanisms, a toilet and a school of fish. Um, it, I, I actually, I, I always have to use toilets. I, I, I think one of my claims to fame in philosophy is I have the most widely discussed toilet in the history of philosophy. <laughs> so, um, so the point here about toilets is that they're very tightly organized. They have a lot of functionally differentiated parts. Um, and to understand how it works, you have to know all of that. And you contrast that with schools of fish. And the interesting thing about schools of fish is while each fish is different, the explanation of certain kinds of ensemble level phenomena in that school of fish may plausibly derive from some very basic and simple local properties of these fish and that they will resemble each other in relevant respects. So you can basically say there's just a whole lot of fish and they're all the same in a way that you can't say that the float valve and the flapper are all the same in the toilet, right? Um, so, and, and, and I hope you see where this is going. That's the individual mechanism, that's the ensemble mechanism, that's one kind of mechanistic model, and that's another kind of mechanistic model, okay? Ah, and here we are. Here's a taxonomy of models, okay? So, the idea here Um, is that, first of all, um, amongst these, these, these models, we first of all distinguish the mechanistic and phenomenological, right? So the phenomenological models are models like the Locke of Volterra models, which simply aim to provide a discussion of the population level dynamics, right? That is in a, Now, there are other kinds of phenomenological models in other fields, but the, those kinds of models in ecology are examples of these phenomenological models, right? Then there are the mechanistic models which seek to explain the entities and activities which are productive of the phenomena. You can think of the phenomenological models as sometimes being the top half of these mechanistic models. Right? Um, but then in there, you have these two kinds of models, the individual models and the ensemble models. And, and the ensemble models are the IBM. But one of the things that's really important in terms of model integration when Tillman was talking about models, he was really, I believe, talking about these individual models, right? So, you know, um, I'm going to butcher this word, uh, al. When plants, 
introduce chemicals into the environment to... Alleopathy. Alleopathy, yes, thank you. Alleopathy, right? This phenomenon is a mechanism by which two species of plants will compete with each other, right? So you, 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 know, you introduce local chemicals into the... Um, uh, uh, in your local environment and it makes it more difficult for these other plants to grow, right? That's what he meant by a mechanism, right? Or, and other kinds of, of you, know, you know, mechanisms by, you, you know, which you crowd out things, various other kinds of mechanisms of competition, predation, various details of predation, right? Those are the kinds of things that are individual mechanisms. And what I would observe here is that this is exactly the kind of stuff that Steve was talking about when he talks about theory. Theory, which is the word that, that uh, Steve and Volker Grimm use in their uh, books on IBMs, to talk about, uh, uh, you know, to talk about what you need to build these models, is basically you need a description of the of the, the, the individual level interactions and the properties of the individuals, those are the entities and the activities, right? Um, and, and, and that's what I think Tillman said we need. And Tillman's right, we need them. But the point is that those models need to be, and, 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 and we need to empirically investigate those things in order to be able to develop those models, but then those feed in to the IBMs. You can't have the IBMs without those. So let me go back to this, uh, this epistemic dilemma, um, or, or to another epistemic dilemma, a related epistemic dilemma. Uh, this is uh, a quotation from uh, a paper uh, that was prime, uh, first authored with Volker Grimm, and, and I think you were on this, right? This is from Science 2005, right? Um, says that bottom-up models, are, which I think are, IBMs are examples of bottom-up models, um, are virtual laboratories where controlled experiments distinguish noise from signal in the system's organization. In particular, experiments contrasting hypotheses for the behavior of in interaction agents will lead to an accumulation of theory of how the dynamic of s systems from molecules to ecosystems